On today's show, we're looking ahead to the 2022 NBA draft. Plenty to get to. So I set the table on today's episode, a broad look at what's coming, the top of the class, what the Hawks options are, number 16 overall, and much more coming up. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1231 of the Lockdown Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you on a Monday. And today's podcast is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered the season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online is where the game starts. And as always, we thank you for listening to the podcast, watching us on YouTube as well. Make us your first listen each and every day. Check us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. And uh, please tell a friend about the podcast. Today's show. We'll get into the NBA draft for the first time in a while. We've done a couple of sort of uh, little little inklings into the NBA draft along the way. But for the most part, it was playoff coverage. It was all the way uh, forward to the metal, all the way to the end of the season with the Hawks making the playoff run they made. And now that's over. We've got a few days to sort of unwind after exit interviews, which, by the way, if you missed that podcast, I talked about the end of the season. And that's exit interview stuff on the last show. But I had to travel. And now we're back. It's May and it's NBA draft time. It won't be only draft stuff in the next couple of weeks and months, but the draft is coming up fast and furious and as you probably saw by the description of this podcast it's going to be draft stuff only today for the most part if you've been listening to the show for a while or even dating back to when i launched the show back in 2016 you will know that i'm a huge fan of the nba draft it's something i take very seriously and very passionate about i cover the draft over at dime on the broader level beyond the hawks but uh i've been doing draft stuff for a very long time i'm doing a little bit less draft coverage on the show the last couple of years because the hawks were competing and of course last year's draft coverage start even later because the Hawks made that huge run at conference finals. It was a very short cycle as a result. But the previous cycle, the 2020 draft, which ended up with the Hawks taking a Kong Wu, of course, was a very long and very broad and also very detailed topic because of the, the, the pandemic striking in the middle of that. It was basically six straight months of NBA, NBA draft talk. So it's been a little bit hit and miss along the way here, but we always like to talk about the draft much, as much as possible on this show. In 2022, we have almost eight weeks before the draft actually arrives, about seven and a half weeks now. We have plenty of time to dive into the prospects and what the Hawks might be doing along the way. I did a couple of shows, as I sort of alluded to earlier on in the season. We talked about uh, the draft with Brian Schroeder, who's a uh, definitely a fan of the podcast, a fan, fan favorite in some respects as well. But on this show a ton in the past and later on in the season, Raphael Barlow, who hosts the NBA Big Board podcast on Lockdown Podcast Network, also joined us on the podcast. So there's been a little bit of draft coverage, but uh, much, much more coming in the coming days and weeks. My plan in general is to have a ton of guests on the show talking about the draft in the the next couple of weeks. And we'll cast a wide net kind of on purpose. We won't only focus on what the Hawks are going to do at number 16, number 44 overall, because that's a little bit narrow. Obviously, it's what this podcast is going to be about more than more often than not is the Hawks stuff and a Hawks lens on the draft. And just as a just sort of a caveat here, I won't always agree with what the guests have to say. I'm sure you won't either. But I think it's good to hear from a lot of people that sort of approach this differently from analytics to people that use the eye test and all and sort of all kinds of evaluations in between. So it helps me do my own my own personal prep and I'll share my own thoughts along the way as well. But sometimes I'm just going to be asking guests questions and getting their thoughts and you can uh, take it all in for what it's worth. And that's all coming up on the podcast in the next couple of weeks. Today's show, though, the plan at least today is to sort of lay out some of my early thoughts on the class and do a sort of a very top level kind of primer before we dig, start digging in really um, in earnest. As a reminder, the Hawks do have two picks in this draft right now, number 16 overall, number 44 overall. Number 16 is, of course, basically right in the middle of the first round. It's, uh, it's a spot where you're looking for to find a contributor on some level. Probably, I want to say probably, not definitely, but probably not a star spot for any team. Obviously, you can get a star there, but that's not what you're looking for necessarily. Uh, you want to aim for upside for sure. But last year, pretty similar spots for the Hawks, actually. Last year, it was tw- number 20 and then number 48 overall. And uh, as we saw a year ago, the Hawks aimed for a combination of upside and also um, floor and intrigue with Jalen Johnson, who I thought was a lottery-level prospect that filled number 20. You're hoping for that kind of guy again. Maybe you have somebody in your top 11 or 12 that falls 16 and you get a great value, as the Hawks did with Johnson, in my mind, a year ago. But really long-term, what you're banking on, at least hopefully in that spot, is to find a player that can help you in the rotation and potentially be a starter, but certainly be a part of your plan moving forward. Not always going to be a, a superstar guy in the middle of the first round, but certainly you have to add to your team as a result of that. And kind of very similar, again, to what the Hawks were looking for last year. At 44, you're in that zone in the second round where you can definitely find um, some help. Obviously, Last year, Shreve Cooper fell a long, long way to the Hawks, and they benefited as a result of that. 
but top 45 ish picks is usually where the line is on where guys are, um, you know, kind of real prospects and not, not always that clean. Sometimes it's a little bit more like 40 or 50, depending on the class, but the Hawks are right in that spot where they might be able to find someone who can help them in the near future at 44 overall as well. We will not ignore that spot. Even if, if obviously there will be more tension on 16 overall, 44 is a pretty valuable asset. You wouldn't want to just pump that down the line. So keep that in mind as well. Um, as far as this class is concerned, um, Actually, the NBA announced the other day that 283 players have um, filed as early entry candidates for this draft. That's 247 from college and 36 guys that are international players. They won't all stay in the draft, but certainly we have a pretty decent idea of who's going to be in this class right now. Some guys will pull out that are maybe like late first, second round kind of guys, but for the most part, the top 20 or so, uh, I can't imagine guys pulling out at this point in time. Barring something that will definitely change in the future. We'll touch on some guys later on on this podcast that I think could be available when the Hawks pick, but I do want to start at the top of the class because, of course, this is a, what most of draft coverage is about, is the absolute top of the class, and the Hawks are not going to be picking up there, barring a weird trade, but I will start here. I believe there's a f- kind of a firm top four player tier in this draft. There is a little bit of flexibility from there, which we'll get into, but I don't have a huge problem with uh, having these four guys in any order, basically, at this point in time. My consensus on this is kind of similar to everybody else's. There are some people that um, have a larger top tier or a smaller top tier, but I, I think most people, at least uh, maybe maybe not a majority, maybe a plurality of people have this top four in some order. But um, those four guys in some order are Gonzaga big man, Chet Holmgren, Auburn forward, Jabari Smith, Duke forward, Paulo Barncaro, and then Purdue guard, Jaden Ivey. Chet Holmgren is probably the most famous of these four guys. Um, he's dating back to high school. He was a uh, number one kind of recruit coming out of high school, got some national TV games as a high school prospect, et cetera. He's fascinating. In a lot of ways, he's a seven footer, but he's less than 200 pounds. Uh, that's pretty wild in itself. If you've seen Chet Holmgren play, you've seen, we've seen this on full display. Um, I know there are people that always watch the NCAA tournament and they made uh, at least a semi run in the, in the uh, tournament. So keep that in mind as well. But an incredibly skilled prospect at both ends of the floor. Um, defensively, he's already an awesome rim protector, shot blocker, has great feel for the game defensively, uses his length really well as someone who is that seven foot frame. He's a good rebound, also a good rebound right now, which is certainly helpful for the future because he's going to have to bulk up along the lines, but he's going to have to get bigger. That's the thing about Holmgren that is uh, there's a little bit more projection in here. The most number one overall pick candidates in the past, because he needs to be, I don't even know what the number is, maybe 220, 230, something like that. He'll still be very skinny at 220. A seven footer at 220 is still very skinny, but seven foot 190 or so is wild skinny, and I think everyone believes this on some level. He's going to have to get bigger to be what he needs to be at the NBA level. Offensively, very skilled as well. Shoots a three already, which is a very positive thing for a seven-footer who's a, sort of a true big man to be able to do. Um, has a, It's pretty comfortable as a ball handler in some respects as well for a big guy. That's very helpful as well. The big question with Holmgren, of course, again, is the frame. Um, but when you combine the perimeter shooting, the ability to finish inside, The shot blocking, the defense, he kind of has a profile that you don't often see. In fact, I know my friend Brian Schroeder always shares these comparisons, but he has some numbers, um, some counting stats, some box score numbers, some advanced numbers that are kind of unmatched. You don't really find players with his profile in terms of all of what I said, like shooting, inside scoring, rebounding, shot blocking, all that stuff, passing assists, et cetera. He does kind of everything. So he's a monster prospect. The big question, of course, is the bulk. And uh, you will certainly hear some people that don't buy it because of that. And I, I don't blame you necessarily. If you, look at guy, if you look at him, just don't really watch him play a ton. The frame is terrifying. So uh, I don't blame you, but I think that the, the full package is pretty intriguing, and I am a, a pretty big fan of what Holmgren can be at the NBA level. So that's one guy. We'll touch on the other three guys in a moment. Before we get to all of that, though, a word from our sponsors on today's podcast. Today's show is brought to you by Bet Online, and of course, baseball is now in full swing, and the NBA playoffs are here in full force with the JPEG slate of games almost every single night for the next couple of months in the basketball world. With that in mind, BetOnline.net is the number one source for all of your sports betting needs and information across the sports world this year from all the latest odds, contests, futures, player props, exotics, and much more. BetOnline remains the best spot for all the latest development sports that includes podcasts and reviews for all the leagues this season, not just basketball or baseball either. They have all kinds of other sports on the agenda with odds on golf and esports, tennis, auto racing, horse racing, hockey, MMA, boxing, soccer, cricket, entertainment bets, and much more. And it's never too early to look ahead to football with futures markets still very much open on the Super Bowl as well as the college football playoff, etc. There's all kinds of stuff available on future racing markets. It also includes the NBA with title, title odds, conference odds, and much more. And beyond that, they have live betting and your favorite casino games, and they have everything you want in the sports wagering space. 
Head to betonline.net right now on your computer mobile device to learn more about all of the trends and the action across the sports world. One more time, that's betonline.net. BetOnline, where the game starts. All right, and three more guys to talk about here at the top of the draft. Briefly, you have Paulo Banquero, who I'll go to now, a much more traditional player in a lot of ways than Holmgren, just physicality-wise. He's uh, power forward size, like 6'10", 240, 250. Um, the way that I would describe this is that he is actually bigger in the measurables than John Collins is. And Collins was like kind of a combo big, even was kind of a center build coming out of college. And Moncaro is more of a uh, inside outside guy, but certainly more of a uh, on ball player in a lot of ways. Comfortable with the ball in his hands, was a primary guy at Duke in a lot of the season. Should be a pretty high score in the NBA, 20 point kind of guy. Um, pretty quickly, I think, in my mind, he plays very well in transition, gets downhill very, very cleanly, very powerfully. He's comfortable as a tough shot maker, sometimes settles a little bit too much in that mid range area, but certainly can make those shots. And at 6'10, he's difficult to guard in those areas. I think, in general, um, there's a little bit of concern that he makes, makes things a little bit more difficult than they have to be offensively. Could be a little bit more of an over reliance on that in the NBA, but I think it might help him to play with better players. Like if he had a top flight point guard, it might help him a little bit in that area, but he's very, very strong, very powerful. Should be able to go to the rim and attack the rim. Uh, defensively, he's not necessarily special in my mind, but he shouldn't be a problem either. He is big, he is athletic. Um, the effort level kind of waxed and waned a little bit at times for Moncara, but when he's dialed in, he's pretty good defensively. So we'll see what he's able to do at the NBA level. But I think that uh, he is certainly a two-way kind of prospect given his size and measurables. Um, I think of the of the four, you could certainly maybe argue that he is the cleanest, like number one option potential. My general feeling on this is that I don't think that I would bet on any of these four guys being number one options in the NBA because that's that's the, at the highest levels. Obviously, if they're going to be on a bad team, that's different. But in my mind, a number one option is a number one option on a good team. Um, it's possible for, I think, all of them on some level. But I think I would bet against all of them doing that. But Vaccaro might be the easiest projection to go ahead and do that because of the tough shot making that he can do. I um, may not be the highest, highest efficiency guy in the world, but certainly can get to his own shot, which is very helpful. Jamar Smith, um, also interesting guy from Auburn, of course. He's a power forward, I think, in terms of like size. Um, height, especially like 6'10", 6'11", plays like a wing in a lot of ways, especially with, especially on offense with his shooting. Um, his shooting is uh, standout level. Uh, I think he gets comparisons to Kevin Durant as a shooter. Uh, I will never do that as far as uh, actually using that comparison because Kevin Durant is an absolute freak, top 10 player of all time. But if you see the height and the length of Smith and the shooting stroke, you kind of see why that would be. And he's definitely an elite shooting prospect for someone that, who is his size, 6'10", 6'11". Um, athletically, he's not like ridiculous, but he's definitely a good athlete. He had a huge dunk in the tournament you, that you probably saw if you're watching closely. Some huge uh, dunks along the way this year as well. that are probably good signs. Uh, defensively, not going to be a center for sure defensively in my mind. More of a potential switch guy, maybe a secondary rim protector, but uh, more of a – he's just going to be okay, I think, defensively. He might be pretty good. Um, if he sort of dials it up, but I can't imagine him being like a huge difference maker defensively, but he should be a pretty good secondary guy. He's smart defensively. He's in the right place at the right time for the most part, which is good to see from a young guy as well. Um, offensively, the question really with Smith is like, can he be a perimeter guy? Like a true, like I'm, I'm not going to say guard, but certainly a wing kind of offensive player. You know, Kevin Durant's a good example here as well. Like Katie's a good ball handler. Um, Smith's jump shot is already there. I think he's comfortable with the ball in his hands, but he is not a high level creator for others right now or more than like a couple dribble guy on offense. If he becomes a better ball handler and a better passer, then the sky's the limit for him on offense. Uh, that, those are definitely big, big ifs at this point in time. And I'm not sure he gets to the rim either a ton. Obviously the height really helps you in that respect, but uh, that's definitely a question mark for me as to whether he can do that. We will see in the near future, but I like Jabari Smith quite a bit. And then Jaden Ivey, uh, the last of the four guys here. Obviously, one of the best guards in the country last year in college basketball, has high-end tools. He's been getting John Morant comparisons for a while. I don't love that. I think he's more of a combo than Ja is more of a point guard in some respects. But Ivy could be a lead guard. I think he's going to be drafted as one, and he, he certainly should be one. If you're, if you're, dropping, if you're dropping him in the, in the top five, you want him to be a, at least be your primary lead initiator if you can help it. He's a legit 6'4". Like he's got good size as a lead guard. Um, certainly a, a great athlete as well. Should be able to get to the rim kind of at will on offense. That's one of his uh, crowning traits in this class. Uh, defensively, it's certainly hit and miss. When he's good, he's good. When he's not, he's not. He's kind of a, maybe a lackadaisical guy. Um, kind of reminds me of Jaw defensively in college and that it was not always great, but when he was down, it was pretty good. I think Ivy's going to be a better defender than Jaw's been so far, which is, by the way, pretty bad in the NBA uh, for John Morant. Uh, but I think Ivy's got good, good tools defensively. Um, I will wonder, as I always do with primary initiators in offense, 
if they have the juice to do both. Um, and I think it's less important. That's that's always important to keep in mind. We talk about Trey Young, of course, all the time on this podcast, John Morant, Donovan Mitchell, whoever else. Um, defense is just less important than offense for those guys. And that's going to be the case for Ivy as well. But I'll be interested to see how, how, how he guards at the NBA level. His jump shot came along this year, which certainly helped to raise his stock into the top five where he really wasn't probably coming into the season. Um, I don't think he's going to be a great shooter by any means, but I think he definitely can shoot, and that's a swing skill. If he can be a good off-dribble shooter, that will help him to be uh, a French star level player. If he doesn't have that, it's going to be a little bit harder for him to uh, make the most of his skills overall. I'm not quite as high on Ivy as some, but I do I do like him quite a bit. He's a great athlete. I think he's definitely a top-four guy for me, no question about that. I think he's number four for me out of four, if I had to say right now, but I can be uh, sort of persuaded on, on, a, on a given day to uh, dive in more on, on him and like him a little bit more. So, uh, this is sort of as my broad overview of this top four guys uh, continues here. I think that uh, this is a draft where there is going to be not a consensus number one overall pick. And that's how I feel. Like I will have my firm order by the end of this class, um, this sort of evaluation by the middle of June. I will probably have an order that I will deliver to you on this podcast. But I will say this, this is more of a uh, tier operation. I'm not going to have anybody that's like head and shoulders number one in this class. It's not a situation where, like last year, I thought K was a clear number one in my mind. Uh, I think I still probably would have K number one, even though uh, obviously Moby was awesome, so was Barnes last year as a rookie. This year, I don't like any of these guys as much as I like Cade a year ago. I will just say that out loud, but I like them all. I think Chet could be an absolute monster on both ends of the floor. I think Paolo's got really good intrigue. Smith's offense is just going to be scary if he has, if has all together. And then Ivy has what most teams are looking for in that they're looking for those on-ball creators, and he has that ability potentially in the NBA. So as far as the overall class is concerned, certainly a lot to like in this draft, and the top four guys are not uh, – can't miss by any means. In fact, I will say probably the – math on this is that one of those guys if not more than one of those guys will probably miss that's kind of where we are in the current nba draft landscape but i think those guys are my, are my top four for a reason and they are pretty talented before we get into the uh, last segment of the podcast we'll talk about all the guys that the hawks are probably likely to at least be evaluating in the coming days there are some guys that are not quite in the top tier for me but they're also i think in my mind likely to be gone when the hawks pick at 16 overall so there's always a group of players if you listen to this podcast for a while you'll know this but um, if the Hawks are picking in the middle of the first round, the end of the first round, there are going to be a bunch of guys that I don't talk about very much on this podcast because they're not at the very top and they're also going to not be in the Hawks range unless they trade up. This year, there will be um, a few of these guys for sure that I'm confident will be gone by the time the Hawks pick. And they are in no order. Ben Matherin from Arizona, um, AJ Griffin from Duke, Shaden Sharp from, from Kentucky, the uh, sort of zero and done player who did not play at all in college last year. Keegan Murray from Iowa and Jalen Duran from Memphis. Those guys, I would be stunned, barring a medical thing or something weird, if they fell to 16. Um, if they do, then take them. That's totally fine. But I think if I, I would project those guys to all be gone. And then there's another guy that I would say, Johnny Davis is pretty close to that list. Davis was uh, arguably the best player in the country for a while this year, defensively uh, on sort of overall at Wisconsin. But uh, a little bit of an older guy, not a great um, athlete. He's along 6'4 and a half, 6'5. So he might fall, but I think he might be in that tier as well of guys that we won't talk about a ton because I'm not sure you're going to be available in this class. So basically, um, that's a good group of like, you know, 10, 11, 12 guys that I expect to be gone by the time the Hawks pick. Now, they could trade up. That's worth noting. The Hawks do have some capital if they want to go out and get somebody this year. Schlenk's only done that once in his career in terms of trading up for a guy. It was DeAndre Hunter. So we'll see if there's a guy in that class that he likes enough to do that. But for now, that's their top. That's the top like 11 or 12 in this draft, at least in a consensus form. And we'll get into the rest of the guys in the Hawks range in a moment. But first, a word from our sponsors on today's podcast. Today's podcast is brought to you by Built Bar. Eating right has been a priority for me this year. The biggest reason why I've been able to actually make that happen is Built Bar. In some ways, it's actually been a lot easier for me to do because I really enjoy eating Built Bars. They have the protein-infused puff bars that are awesome. It's all the other fan favorites from Built Bar that I've always enjoyed across the years. And each and every bar is 100% real chocolate on the outside, and that makes a huge difference both in taste and in texture. And the taste really is Magnificent, let's just say. On top of the taste, Built Bars are low-calorie and high-protein, and you can easily replace your candy bars with Built Bars this year, both in taste and to improve your overall nutrition. Built.com has all the info that you want on the nutrition side, and you won't believe what you see, honestly, because most Built Bars only have 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein with a very low calorie count. And on the flavor side, Built Bar has all kinds of long-time flavors like coconut almond, lemon almond cheesecake, and many more, as, as well as new flavors coming all the time. I have never had a bad flavor of Built Bar. They are all fantastic, and I can personally vouch for that at this point in time. The best way to check, about, check out everything from Built Bar is go to Built.com and use the promo code LOCKED15 when you get there. If you do that, 15% off on your order with Built Bar. That's LOCKED15 is the promo code at Built.com. If, if you go there and put that in, LOCK15, 15% off at Built.com. That's promo code LOCK15, 15% off at built.com. 
All right, before we get out of here on this, uh, again, very high-level uh, kind of brief primer setup for the Atlanta Hawks and the NBA draft, uh, a bunch of guys I'll touch on here. Uh, this is I'm just going to say this right now. This is not an endorsement for the Hawks to draft any of these players. Um, they will probably take a guy from this list if they say 16 in my mind, but this is, I'm going to give you a pretty wide range of like, you know, 12, 13, 15 guys briefly that I think the Hawks could be evaluating in the coming days. Um, there are four guards that I think are pure backcourt guys. Um, and they are Dyson Daniels, Ty Ty Washington, Jaden Hardy, and Blake Wesley. Uh, Dyson Daniels is a guy I like a lot from the G League Ignite program, a great defensive prospect, probably the best defensive guard in the entire class, great length, 6'6", six, 6'7". Six, six, and as a result of that, he would fit very well for the Hawks. I've had to do a couple mock drafts already uh, for Dime, and I've put him, I've had him with the Hawks at least once, if not twice. I think he'd be a great fit for the Hawks. He might be gone. Uh, a good pass, good passer, good finisher. The jump shot's a question, but defensively, he is kind of a monster. So that's a guy to keep an eye on for sure. Um, Tata Washington is a sort of a smaller combo guard, not a great athlete, but a very, very skilled player out of Kentucky. Dribble pass shoot guy. The Hawks always seem to like those guys. Kentucky guards, by the way, are always overperforming, it seems like, from Devin Booker, Tyler Hero. Um, Tyrese Maxey, et cetera. Um, they have some, some uh, let's just say history boosting from college. So keep an eye on Tata Washington. Jaden Hardy was a, uh, a big time name coming out of high school, has a lot of scoring upside, you really get to his shot a lot. I'm not sure how great of a shooter he actually is, but he's going to have to make some shots. Most of his projection is as a scorer, and that's the kind of prospect that I'm not going to love necessarily, but he does have some real intrigue as a scorer. Keep an eye on him as well. Like Wesley is sort of a late riser. Um, a good guy getting to the rim, good athlete, should be pretty good defensively off the ball in particular. Not a great efficient scorer or shooter in college, but certainly someone who came out of nowhere to be kind of a big time first round rising prospect at the end of the year. Um, from there, some wings and forwards. I'm going to group those guys together for this purposes. Um, I'll say this, uh, Ochai Baji is on this list from, from Kansas. Obviously, the national, uh, sorry, the final four most outstanding player for Kansas this year as they won the championship. He's 22 years old, was a four-year college guy. That's always a little bit interesting at this point in his NBA uh, tenure, but sort of an NBA role player projection. I wish he was 6'7", 6'8". He's always a 6'5", six, six, or so. Good shooter. No solid defense. I'm not going to be. I don't think he's going to be a great defense a defender at the NBA level, but certainly someone who's a, sort of a low, low variance pick. I think he's going to be pretty good in the NBA, just not a, not a superstar project, upside kind of projection there. Malachi Branham from Ohio State is definitely different uh, in that he's a one and done guy, kind of a six six power wing type from Ohio State. Not supposed to be a one and done coming out of high school necessarily, but he's come on strong. Um, seems to be projected in the top twenty almost everywhere now. Um, very, very physical player, very efficient last year. Takes some tough shots for sure, but one of the higher upside guys in this range in my mind. Defensively, he has some work to do. There's some nice flashes, but not always consistently. Defensively, he's pretty intriguing. I like him a lot as a uh, sort of an upside swing. Um, then you have the opposite of that, EJ Labdell, his teammate at Ohio State, more of a power forward type. He'll be 22 in December. Does a lot of stuff well at the college level, super physical. Um, certainly sh shot the ball a lot better during his college tenure at the end of his, at the end of his career, but um, not a great upside play for sure. More of like a low to the ground, I don't know, combo forward type that uh, more of a plug and play, but not necessarily a long-term projected star by any means. You have Marjan Beauchamp from the Julie Goodnight program. Actually very old for a guy in that program. He'll actually be 22 years old soon, but I like him as kind of a do-everything wing type. Not a huge offensive projection upside kind of guy, but a good defender, plays very smart. I like I like the way he plays overall. Um, you have Jeremy Sohan from Baylor. He was almost in my group of guys who will be gone by the time the Hawks pick, but a 6'9 forward, very athletic guy, very fluid athlete, good passer, good defender, I think, projection-wise. Very impressive at times at Baylor, playing as a one-and-done. Um, kind of can space it a little bit um, offensively. Also kind of a little bit hit and miss consistency-wise, but certainly a young guy who came on uh, in a big way this last year. You have Tari Eason from LSU, uh, one of the better defenders in the class. I like him a lot. 6'8", strong, already good rebounder, very physical point of attack guy. Would definitely help the Hawks defensively um, quickly if they wanted to play him. Plays hard, can attack the rim on offense. Not a great shooter by any means yet, but that's sort of a long time uh, projection thing for him. But I think he's a guy that would be very interesting for the Hawks if he's still available at 16 overall. Um, Kendall Brown is kind of uh, more of an off-radar guy for me right now, but he was kind of supposed to be ahead of his teammate in Jeremy Sohan at Baylor this year. Um, not the case now by any means, but he's a great athlete. Offensively, not a whole lot going on there, but really, really, really gifted offensively and, and defensively could be awesome down the line, but offensively a long way to go, obviously. And then Nikola Jovic, who played in the Adriatic League. Yes, it's not Jokic, it's Jovic. Um, 6'10", kind of scoring forward type. Gotten some comparisons to a young Gallo, if you're a Hawks fan listening to this podcast. Good passer, good feel overall. 
not as not quite the same little shooter that Gallo is, uh, at least as is now, but certainly could project as a shooter. I think will be a shooter long term. Not a great athlete by any means. It might not be the greatest fit with the Hawks as a result of that because of his limitations defensively, but certainly a, a high upside offensive prospect could be a, pretty much a game changer in this range if he gets there. And then a couple of big a couple of big guys to mention at the end of this podcast. I'll say this now at the end of the show. I'd have a hard time with the Hawks taking a pure center in this draft unless they had a deal in place to move on from Capella or Kongwu. It's just kind of hard for the Hawks to use a mid-first-round pick on a guy who just has nowhere to go. Um, this, that's not to say these guys are not first-round picks, because I think they are, but if you have Capella and a Kongwu on the team, taking another pure center doesn't make a lot of sense, so just say that out loud. Obviously, we'll know more later on. Um, they might move on from one of those guys eventually, but for now, that's my uh, little spiel on these two guys. But they are Mark Williams and Walker Kessler. I think, obviously, Jalen Durant will be on at this point in my mind. But Mark Williams is a great rim protector, shot blocker type. Should be an awesome rebounder in the NBA as well. Uh, should be a great play finisher. He's so long, has a huge like, catch radius, catches everything lob-wise. Like, think like Capella um, with that. But, um, yeah, really an interesting sort of I'm – not, I'm, I'm not sure he's like a high upside prospect, but certainly someone who projects to me as like a starting center in the NBA. A very a valuable player. Um, not going to be a lottery guy for me, but at least not a top 10 guy for me, but certainly would be a real a realistic pick in this range, if not for the Hawks roster makeup. And then Walker Kessler was genuinely unbelievable this year as a college defender and shot blocker, rim protector type, probably the best guy in the country at just doing that. Not as impressive as Williams in space, a little bit more limited as a result of that, but more of a certainly more of a shooter than most guys his size, the seven footers. Not elite as a shooter, but certainly can shoot a little bit. Um, was actually at UNC before Auburn this last year. Both guys are certainly first-round picks, but uh, tough for Atlanta for me to take either one of those guys. So, again, that's a lot of names. There'll be more probably that I'll mention in the near future. I try to go as broadly as possible without going overboard. Um, there are a couple more names I'll at least just kind of spit out for you um, so that I don't leave anybody completely out of this podcast that could be in the range of the Hawks at 16 overall. Um, I will just mention uh, Usman Jang of New Zealand Breakers in the NBL. He's been um, – the guy I haven't seen as, as much of. I'll just be candid about that because the Hawks playing so long, um, but certainly has been in the top in the top twenty in a lot of mocks recently. Um, guy from NBL, so like nineteen year old, six ten, kind of forward type, interesting kind of talent. Um, from there, other than that, oh Patrick Baldwin as well is the other guy. Um, so he was a five star prospect who went to play for his father at Milwaukee, uh, small school, obviously mid major, and had a dreadful season but still has the 6'9 um, tools shooting prospect. Um, it's really hard to figure out what to do with him because he was so bad in college as a number one option this year with a terrible guard crop with him, but certainly a top 20 talent in this class. Um, after that, maybe you want to mention like, I don't know, Terquavion Smith, uh, Dale and Terry is someone who's been at least on some radars as sort of a 6'7 six, six, wing guy from Arizona. Um I don't know. I don't want to go too crazy deep on, on guys in this range. Um, Trevor Keels is a favorite of some. Uh, I know that Harrison Ingram, five-star prospect from Stanford, that kind of had a, a rocky season, could also be on the ra on the radar. Um, I know Sam Vecini is a fan of Jake LaRavia uh, from Wake Forest. I had, I had him like in, the, in his top, top 20, which I think is a little bit aggressive for Jake LaRavia, but still a guy who's pretty interesting as a prospect. So um, there'll be a lot of names. We'll talk about Bryce McGowan from Nebraska, et cetera. So that's sort of a – a wide net on this class. We'll have much more with guests and myself. We'll sort of answer some mailbag questions. I'll give you more of my opinions on these guys in the future, but I want to at least give you that one kind of primer here at the beginning of the, of the cycle and uh, seven and a half weeks to go before the NBA draft. We'll have plenty of wall to wall coverage in this space. So with that said, we'll have uh, that as well. And I will, I will just say there'll be more on the actual Hawks roster in the coming days. I know people were talking about Rudy Gobert, Rudy Gobert rumors or at least pseudo rumors. Um, some player review stuff's coming in the coming days. I all that's coming. I promise you. I'm not going. To, I'm not going to, to neglect the Hawks in favor of just the draft stuff the next two months. But we'll do it all. And uh, please subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, etc. Please follow the show on Twitter at Locked On Hawks. Follow me on Twitter if you'd like to at BT Roland. And we'll see you later on in the week.